could Saturday be the night that Stanford is back and the never-ending Michigan quarterback saga with the deck perhaps stacked for J.J. McCarthy. This is a College Game Day podcast for Wednesday, September 7th. Reese Davis here along with Pete Thamel and David Pollock joining us right out of the gate. David, let's start with Pete and breaking news here. Pete, you broke the story that perhaps Clemson has a new threat in the ACC because Wake Forest has its quarterback back. Yeah, I mean, this just happened today. Obviously, a, one, a feel-good story. Uh, Sam Hartman had a scary issue. It was a, it was a blood clot. Uh, the school revealed uh, in a release later today. Um, he's been fully medically cleared by all of Wake Forest's top experts, and uh, they feel like he'll be QB1 come Saturday at Vanderbilt. Uh, it looms large over the ACC, quite frankly, Reese, where Wake Forest has been in the thicket of the, the of the conversation in that conference last year, and they expect to be this year. I mean, they have virtually every starter back re receiver Donovan Green returned from being injured last year. Their offense was expected to, again, be one of the most prolific in college football. Um Obviously, Mitch Griffiths did a nice job um, against VMI on Thursday night, but he's not Sam Hartman. Boy, Sam Hartman's got a lot of a lot of miles logged and touchdowns thrown for the uh, for the for the Demon Deacons, and I believe Clemson co goes there Week Four. Reese, is that right? Mm -hmm. I believe that is right. That could loom with a win at Vanderbilt on Saturday as one of the bigger games in the history of Wake Forest football. And that also uh, could lead me to, I think we're going to do hot and lukewarm takes a little bit later on in the show. And that will probably lead me to my lukewarm overreaction tape that, uh, that maybe Clemson's a little more vulnerable than I thought. I was, I was semi alarmed by the offense for most of the night. Uh, Pollock is with us. So Pollock, I know uh, you've got, high school football to coach. I want to see, we're at the point in the week where we've really turned our attention to the games on Saturday. Film study has been done. Game plans have been formulated. What, what's, been, what's been leaping off the screen at you with the tape you've watched? Well, I, I think last night, you know, we're right after the aftermath, aftermath of Clemson. And I, I feel the same way, Reese, that me and you talked about in the preseason. I think, I think Cade Klubnick is going to be the guy at some point. And, you know, I, I only saw one drive last night from him. Granted, it was a touchdown drive. It was in mop-up duty. But did you watch just the energy level that he brought to the team? Like, I, I, I'm just – like, he ran to the line of scrimmage. You could tell he played in a fast-paced offense and offense in high school. I mean, you know, three-time state championship quarterback – I could see the accuracy right away on several throws. I saw the mobility and quickness. Um, you know, I didn't think DJ had as bad of a night as his numbers might have looked. I think the receiving position for Clemson is going to be very interesting to watch because we're used to the last several years of you got freaks jumping off the page, and that guy's going to be great, and that guy's going to be great. And I, I don't see a lot of great. I saw a lot of guys that could have made a lot more plays for their quarterback um, in the back end, but I see a Clemson defense that's dirty. It's going to be really, really good. It's got speed. It's got physicality in the trenches. Multiple guys, not just, you know, I mean, I, I could go down the list of numbers of guys that I was like, oh, my God. Like, wait a minute, 33? Holy holy cow. I just I just knew about 11 and 98. Now you, you had this guy and you had zero and five. I'm just like, good Lord. They've got a plethora of superhumans. Uh, you saw Trent's athletic ability last night at linebacker. Good Lord. He could, he could roll. Um, so, I think the quarterback position is going to be very Kelly Bryant-esque. I really, really do. I think uh, Klubnik's just got a little bit more juice in his feet. I think he's got a little bit more accuracy. And I think they're going to need it, you know, down the road with this offensive line that's a work in progress still a year later from what it used to be. Um, you got some. You got something to pass that, Reese? Uh, you know, I no, I will say this about Uyanga Lale. I He looks timid. To me, and he didn't look timid as a freshman. It's like he's playing as if he has the weight of the world on his shoulders. Now, I, I can't sit here and tell you uh, because I'm not at practice every day. Does he process? Does he see it? Does he understand concepts and game plans? And does he understand the defense that he's watching? But when I watch him play in the games, he looks indecisive and slow. Like he wants to make sure he doesn't make a mistake. And it slows everything down. And well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know how you get. I don't know how you sure. get past that. I hope he does because he seems like a, a good young man. I hope he does. But it, that's things. the way it looks to me. 
there's two things I can tell you for sure. And sorry for interrupting you. There's two things that I know. One is his mechanics are off. His, his top half and lower half don't work great together. Like that's something that disturbs me when I watch him play. The most disturbing thing about DJ, it's not his talent, Reese. It's not his, his vision is one thing that, that could be worked on. And you saw that last night. It's his eyes. As soon as he sees another color jersey, his eyes are down. His eyes come straight down and he is ready to get the heck out of Dodge. And it is hard to be great behind an offensive line that's not great mm-hmm. to be if you're if if, it's, if your eyes are going to go down and you're not going to negotiate the pocket, move and look to throw the football again. So I think it's I think it's disturbing that he, he, you still watch him last night and Georgia Tech's not a good team at all. And I still see the panic. Listen, when you played Georgia's defense last year in the opener, shoot, I'd have left the freaking pocket too. Nobody, <laughs> nobody blocked for him. Nobody did much good. But last night, it was just a bad indication of, like, his eyes come down too quick. It's going to be very hard to be a great quarterback behind a decent offensive line, a new system that you're growing in, if you can't be patient and keep your eyes down the field. There, Can I ask David a question, have... Reese? Yeah, Can go I ahead, man. Because I'm curious. He was pretty bullish on Klubnik, and that was a little bit surprising to me, although it, we may get there. But David's mentioned he's been in locker rooms where there's been quarterback battles. So I think this is the interesting philosophical question for Dabo going forward. And I'd be curious for David's perspective from having been in, you know, been in locker rooms for this. When is it safe to go to Klubnik? Because it's going to be hard to go back to DJ. And the Kelly Bryant example is the, the obvious one that comes to mind, but there's plenty of other ones. And I'm not saying DJ is going to pack it in and go in the portal, but he certainly has to have a segment of the team behind him at some point. Like there, that's a that's a thorny political position. And I'd be curious if you saw enough to do it immediately or eventually, David. No, I don't think you do it immediately because I don't think DJ played awful. Um, but one thing I did like, he, I did like when, when as soon as they scored last night, as soon as Club Nick scored, DJ went out there and jumped up on him and celebrated. I love that. I love that from DJ um, because this isn't a situation. As soon as he came in the game, what did you hear? You heard roars from Clemson fans. Like you can tell that they're excited about this kid. So it's going to be hard to manage this. And Dabo's done it before, obviously, mm-hmm. with with Kelly Bryant and Trevor Lawrence. But the thing is, if you if you if you have to make this decision and you have to maximize this, I have to see enough from Cade Klubnik in the games when it matters a little bit more that I go, dude, I've seen it. You guys have seen it. I have to prove to these guys on, on my team. They're like, I got to do what's best for my team. And these kids see it in practice every day and they got a better judge of it than we do, obviously, because they're seeing how accurate he is. Cause I'm just telling you, I saw his accuracy right away. Like you could see it. Right away, throwing the throwing the ball up the seam to the tight end, like he's he's got. A, I, I watched the spring game, and when I watched the spring game, Pete, I was sold. Like I saw him move a step faster than DJ. I saw him throw the football on the move very accurately. And I'm just thinking about the pieces they have and what they have in this offense and what I've seen from DJ. There's two spot. There's two main schools in college football that are in the top six right now, in the top six that are in playoff contention that to me will make quarterback changes before the season ends and that have a chance to be in the college football playoff. And that's Clemson and that's Texas A&M. Well, here's how, if this happens and if they go to club, Nick, history will guide us as to how it happens. People forget in that Kelly Bryant, Trevor Lawrence year, I called the Clemson, Texas A&M game and Trevor came in through a touchdown pass right off the bat and then got a little sideways came unglued a little bit. Kelly Bryant came back into the game and saved that game for them. So Dabo didn't rush, but I think it was only a week or two later that it was a game against Georgia Tech, Kelly struggled a little bit, and Trevor sort of took off with it. And it was right after that that they made the move. Kelly decided to leave, and understandably so, by the way, because he, he, needed, you know, he needed to play to pursue his goal. And Christian Wilkins, I think, took Trevor Lawrence to breakfast and assured him that, you know, the team was going to be behind him. So if anybody can handle this, it's Dabo Sweeney. Uh, Dabo, I think, handles these types of situations with as much aplomb and diplomacy as you can while still being tough enough 
to make difficult decisions. And if that, in fact, comes to be, it'll be because it's evident not to the people in the stands and those of us in the media who get excited about recruiting rankings and and mop up time touchdowns. It'll be because it's apparent to everybody in the coaches' offices and everybody in the locker room that they need to move in that direction, even if DJ's still a, a top flight quarterback, which I think he can be. Now, whether you know whether that happens this year at Clemson, I hope it does for him, or if you know if there's another path that eventually will be taken. I want to know what David thinks of AM now. He just like dropped that little nugget. Of well, the he's a Max, he, he's a Max Johnson guy from way, no, way back. I know, right? but like I'm I just curious that that's all because there's another five star freshman sitting there too. It, it got nothing to do with being a Max Johnson guy. It has everything to do with I, I, yeah, well, first, yeah, I, I respect Max Johnson and I respect what he did last year. I respect what he put on tape. I respect his toughness. I, I respect he has enough mobility to make plays. I, I, I saw Haynes King make some big plays, but I also see some things that just disturb me. And I'm just telling you, down the road when I need a guy and I have to – and I have to have – like, I, I think he's a good athlete. I think A-Chain is the one that makes that go, and he is absolutely the, the, the main focal point of that offense. And whoever else is at QB is going to be highlighting – him and then and then showcasing what they can do they're not going to be built around him so if Haynes King can be an athlete and they build it around waggles and boots and attack the outer part of the field I think it's good if you're going to ask that kid to beat you with precision throws over the middle of the field I don't see that now listen we're just getting started and that was week one but I, I can't wait to see Miami week three you know, I can't wait to see, you know, App State didn't play much defense last week, so I don't know about App State this <laughs> week, but, but I, I can't wait to see that unfold. But both of those, like, I've seen enough information on the starter, and I've seen enough information on the guy that's behind him. And listen, I think Club Nick's a lot harder, but I think DJ's, I've seen enough of what he's done wrong. And I, and I think I understand what he is. I know he was an all-world prospect. I know he lost 30 pounds, and he, and he looks like a better runner, but – I don't. I just think it's a matter of time. Have you have you had a chance to watch much of the SC tape yet, David? Yes, and Rice okay. is really really ungood. Really. Let me, ungood. let me let me ask David this: Like, when do you watch this tape? <laughs> like like the, like you just casually watch Rice in USC at like seven a.m. on a Tuesday? Like, <laughs> well, we have we we have an app where we have coaches tape. So okay. we as as soon as I can get the eleven on eleven, and as soon as I can get the coaches tape, which is usually Sunday. And then uh, all day yesterday, I'm, I'm basically falling asleep, you know, on the couch watching games, <laughs> different games and, and watching different people. But I also try to watch all the games while they're going on, too. I, I, thought, their, I thought their defense was leaky, despite the fact that they scored three times. Rice kept, kept popping plays, and I'm not sure. Yeah, look, Stanford hasn't been able to run the ball the way it customarily did. They did against Colgate. I'm not sure that counts. But – I don't know, man. I don't know if it's as easy as as people might think on the farm. Um, no, I don't Saturday think I, I didn't. I definitely didn't leave that game and go, oh, man, USC's legit. Like, this is a team that that I'm ready to throw. And now, listen, let's be honest. Reese, what game did we live saying that Alabama and, and Georgia? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of other to right. go. Yeah. Oh, man, like they, they kicked the crap out of who they played and they looked like they got no holes like that was week one. I'm not, I'm not ready to say it's Alabama and Georgia versus the world. I know some people are ready to say that, but like, I, I still want to see Ohio state. I, okay. I'm going to transition real quick. I'm going to give you USC. USC played rice. Rice is very ungood. I saw enough whole, uh, glaring weaknesses and uh, I saw enough things to be concerned that I want to see about the Stanford game and more, more in the future. How about Notre Dame? Notre Dame's defense Reese I, I wish I could take all you nerds through tape who like tape like me that are just a loser that have nothing better to do and show how many flipping coverages Notre, Notre Dame ran. Like Al Golden comes from the NFL and he emptied the barrel on every coverage when it comes <laughs> two down rushes, Tampa two, you know, inserting safeties down. I mean, he, he, he flipping did everything and it was awesome and kept CJ Stroud and company off balance and basically said, bro, if you're going to beat me, you're going to pound me. You are not going to get big plays. I'm going to keep mixing up my coverages. And to, to Ohio State's credit, 
Mayan Williams proved to be the tree stump he is. Every time he runs the football, by the way, it's a business decision because he's like five foot one, 230 pounds, and he's pissed off. So that's a really good combination for a running back. Um, but I thought Notre Dame did an excellent job. And, and then I thought Ohio State's defense, too, was, was really fun. It looked like it looked a lot like Jim Knowles in the past, a lot of different techniques, a lot of different coverages, a lot of post-snap movements, not just I'm going to line up and be better than you, which is what Ohio State typically has done in the past. I think um, I saw a lot from them, too, that I really, really liked. So I'm not as I'm not flipping out on Ohio State because I think Notre Dame played great and used all the time they had very efficiently in this offseason and got ready to play. Because I tell you what, if you got kids, here, here's the thing. I think everybody listens to this and goes, well, why doesn't everybody do that? Because not everybody has smart enough kids to do that. Okay. It takes really, really smart football players to be able to line up and do six or seven different coverages and know your rules and know the difference. You know, what's easy. It's easy to have an athlete and go, Hey, you go guard him. That's what's easy. It's, it's really easy LSU to be man to man and go, my guy's better than yours. Don't think too much. We can change a few things, but, you know, don't don't get too crazy. So it's not easy to do what Notre Dame did. They had the whole offseason to do it. It'll be interesting to see everybody else who plays Ohio State and if they can, you know, still still do some of that stuff that they did. Well, isn't – I don't know. I may be mis, uh, misattributing the story, but wasn't it Deion Sanders? They were explaining all of the – a coverage concept to to him about what they were doing I think when he was maybe with the Cowboys and his response to it was yeah yeah I know I understand all of it but I got him right and you're like <laughs> yeah and he's like okay well then you worry about those other guys because you won't have to worry about him right <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yep and that's 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 a that's a luxury that not many teams in the country are afforded the right to be able to do and Notre Dame wasn't so Notre Dame was smart enough to go yeah these guys are these guys are a little better than me I'm not going to do that Pete I agree I mean we said this uh we said this on Monday too that I felt like that particular game showed me more about Notre Dame than causing any any doubts about Ohio State um what what's jumped off the page at you coming up this weekend Pete what do you what do you wound up about um, I, I guess I'm probably most wound up to see BYU and Baylor. Nice late kick. Like we'll be cleared out of our, uh, our, our business. Uh, well, you won't be Reese cause you'll have, uh, you have done planes, trains and automobiles to get to a farm. Um, yeah. but I'll, I'll have wound out of my work from uh, Daryl K Royal that day. And, and I really want to sit in and, and digest how good is Baylor actually, can they come in and smash them out the big 12 again, like they did last year. And look, BYU is basically the PAC 12 champion last year. So mm -hmm. can they come, yep. can they come back and assert themselves? Um, to me, I don't think it's close. They are the team, you know, quote unquote, outside the power five that has the best chance to make a playoff case. Cause I think they're built like the teams that typically make the playoff up front on both sides. Uh, I had some coaches there this summer. Tell me they felt like this was their best collection of skill that they've had there at, at, at BYU. Again, not a place noted for as much skill outside of tight ends, but they really felt like they were uh, explosive enough and they had guys who could stretch the field for Jaron Hall. So I, I think that's a fascinating game on a, on a lot of different ways. And I think in a little bit, it says like, all right, how many areas of the country are we going to have in this college football playoff talk? You know, especially mm -hmm. with Utah, you know, they have long odds now to, to come back and make it. I'm certainly not excluding them, but they've got a long undefeated road to toe through the PAC 12. Can BYU keep hopes alive there? Can Baylor assuming Texas, uh, you know, gravity hits Texas like it usually does when you play a Nick Saban team can Baylor uh, who, who starts a lot ranked a lot higher now would have been harder for Baylor last year to do anything playoff wise because they would have started from so far out in the field so I just think those are two you know we're, we're searching for someone outside the big three right those of us to cover the sport one to 130 and I think those are somebody can come out of that game and declare themselves in that conversation I had a coach tell me yesterday that it had Baylor circled on the schedule from the beginning because of what you said they ran for nearly 300 yards against them last year that that's going to be that's going to be far more intense than the average than the average fan thinks when that game winds uh, winds up and tees it up on Saturday night. Pollock, I know you got to go, Coach. Man, a great insight, great stuff. You got a parting shot? Anything else? High speed internet coming to your house? 
soon. Oh my you're... gosh. High, high speed internet. My life may never be the same. The film watching might be get replaced with uh, video games, but I hope not for my job's sake. But hey, Tennessee Pittsburgh to me next week mm. will be really, really fun. I, I'm looking forward to seeing exactly what Tennessee has. We'll get a gauge of Pitt and, and see where they're at too. But I think Tennessee is still a team. And then Florida, Kentucky, I think will be fun to, to watch the Anthony Richardson show and Florida hosting Kentucky. Both of them both of them rank. What do they do? What do they do for? What does Anthony Richardson do for an encore from last week in the Utah game? If if they get it in the red zone, he'll make sure they score touchdowns. You ain't lying. Big, strong, athletic. Yeah, that's a good. Good things happen. Good things happen for sure. All right, Paul, I go coach him up. See you, dudes. Thanks, David. Pete, I don't want to belabor this Michigan quarterback point, but, but I'm going to go ahead and belabor the Michigan quarterback point. It was pointed out, I don't think we mentioned this on Monday. A couple of things. J.J. McCarthy starting this week against Hawaii. There was an Instagram post that depicted someone holding on to a tree limb, hanging off the ledge, someone trying to help him, and and the person wouldn't let go of a heavy weight that was almost making the branch break, and it was labeled ego. And, you know, there's been speculation, was that aimed at Cade McNamara? Was that something else? Was it just motivational? Whatever it was. But the one thing that does seem obvious is that the opponent, not that Michigan's got a, you know, a murderer's row of non-conference opponents anyway, but Hawaii would seem particularly conducive to rolling up some numbers. Um, you view this as being a lean and, and moving toward a self-fulfilling prophecy. We talked a good bit earlier about Clemson and whether they might make a move. Do you see any of that at play in the Michigan situation? Yeah. Well, Reese, we don't have to apologize for belaboring the Michigan quarterback situation because they have delivered it us to belabor. When you yeah. self-induce a quarterback controversy and declare very uniquely that you're going to have two different starters start game one and game two before game one, you are inviting all kinds of scrutiny, criticism, et cetera. So I, I don't feel bad about this becoming a sort of a hobby horse topic because they, they, they Amazon prime the hobby horse to our house. So um that said, certainly there, there, there would seem to be simply by performance, Cade McNamara has won that job. And is this a case where Jim Harbaugh, who knows a lot more quarterback play than all of us, uh, thinks in his heart of hearts, McNamara is good enough to get them to the Big Ten title game or get them to the Ohio State game, I should say, which will be definitively now after Iowa uh, went – prehistoric their own prehistoric offense uh last week they michigan will not be an underdog in a game until they go to mm-hmm. columbus I, I think that's i'd be stunned there'd have to be some pretty significant turn for uh for, for that to happen so um does harbaugh and his heart of hearts treating this like we need to make sure we get the guy who can go to columbus and win and maybe go win the minutes a playoff game and maybe the image of McNamara's struggles, which again, were not at all his fault in that game. They were just overwhelmed and swallowed whole by Georgia in the college mm-hmm. football playoff last year. Mm-hmm. So maybe he thinks that ultimately for the team's long-term prospects, they're going to need McCarthy instead of McNamara. I think that's exactly what it is. I think he believes that McCarthy gives him a higher upside, gives him a better chance to win championships. My issue with that, is that it has to be proven. And from what I understand, that that maybe hasn't been the case. Now, maybe it will be through Saturday. You're in, you, I think I mentioned earlier the way Dabble Sweeney handled it before and, I, and the way I suspect he's going to handle it again here. This seems to be trying to force it. Now, that could also be a product of Michigan's schedule in these first three weeks of time, a, a de facto preseason for them. Maybe that's what's driving some of this, but it seems as if he's not allowing it to unfold organically. And if he's right and McCarthy is the upside guy and is the guy who ultimately will give them the better chance, then that opportunity will manifest itself at some point in the season and then become apparent. And it seems to me that they're pushing it at the risk. It may work out fine, but at the risk of alienating people on the team. Uh, Kate McNamara is a captain, you know, and, and not these guys, when, when players elect their captains, it's not a little pat on the back. 
they they mean it almost without fail. Sometimes when coaches uh, ordain captains, then maybe not. But uh, you know, if if the players are the ones behind that, then it's a little different. And I think it's a really really compelling study in human nature. And really, you know, quarterback is the most unique. Uh, no, I'm sorry. No, it's not. There's no gradations of unique. Something is either unique or it's not. It is, um, it is a unique position in sports. And because of that, I think it has to be handled in a way, a different way than you would handle a competition at wide receiver, running back, defensive end. And I'm not, I, I think it is fair to question whether this is the best way. I, I will hasten to agree with you. Jim Harbaugh has forgotten more about quarterback play in the last five seconds than I'll ever know. And that's great. But we can all, we can all critique how things are handled. And, you know, I, I'm really interested to see whether this divides the team, whether it works, and whether it is indeed what it seems to be that the lean is to McCarthy, regardless of whether he has, you know, uh, dominated the competition in the days in practice and in the first game leading up to this, because rare is the guy who can stand in there thinking that his coach doubts him. It can happen. I mean, it does from time to time, but it's not common. I think it's real easy for us as observers and fans to say, well, just go, just go play and show them. If you're human and your coach doubts you, or you, or even if he doesn't, but you suspect he does, that becomes an impediment to performance. It just does. And I know there's a certain amount of it you have to overcome. So it becomes a question of proportion. How much do you think he doubts you? Is he like giving you a chance and wants you to do it, but he's not sure? I think people respond to that better than they do hey, I've won this thing, and he's still trying to find a way to get me out, if he feels that way. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. I think it's the really intriguing aspect of this. I really just appreciated that, like, your seventh-grade English teacher came back from the dead to scold you on the different variations of unique Reese. That, do, do that, that, that was pretty impressive. You like do, do you know yourself. who it was? Do you know who it was who that was really it? got me on that? Uh, Jay Billis's lovely oh. wife, Wendy. Oh, okay. uh, Wendy has uh, informed Jay several times over the years that something is unique or it's not. And so that's <laughs> been, that's been, uh, uh, Wendy will be delighted that she made the podcast, although she won't care. You know, she's a remarkable artist and, huh. uh, and cares. I mean, uh, you should see her work. It's, it's fabulous. And his daughter, Tori too. Um, Jay's, Jay's art is being snarky. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, but, he's uh, Picasso he's, then. <laughs> no, uh, no, he's the, he's the best. He's the best. But no, his, it, we talked about this and Wendy pointed that out. And it's become, it's become one of those uh, grammatical things. And I'm sure you're, you're great with words. I'm sure I make grammatical mm. errors all the time, but I try not to. And there, when things get stuck in your head, those are the ones that you, that you want to avoid. It's like, um, like number and amount bother me. When people screw that up, uh, you know, uh, things that you can count should be a number. Otherwise, it's an amount and all of that. But anyway, I've digressed into English class here. So Yeah. If we're trying to get people to stop listening to the podcast, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good <laughs> rabbit think, hole. Hey, go look, I look at this podcast as a way to help people, uh, Pete. And if I can help them communicate <laughs> more effectively, because when you can communicate and articulate your thoughts, that's powerful, man. And if you do so in a grammatically sound foundation then let's do it. <laughs> yeah. The fundamentals podcast here. Yeah, get us back on track here. Let's talk football. What do you got? Uh, where do you want to go? Taylor? Let's or, talk. Or let's do it? this. How about some teams that didn't get a win that you think uh, most likely to do so? I've got a, I've got three games here for you. Spend so much time on the top of the radar games. There are a few others that could really point for a direction for a season. Three that come to mind here, Kansas and West Virginia. Look, if Kansas wins three games, it's great. They've already won one. Uh, I think they're much improved under Lance Leipold, just in terms of discipline, things like that. But West Virginia is what we're looking at after that heartbreaking loss to Pittsburgh. Memphis and Navy. Um, Navy with the dreadful, dreadful loss to Delaware, Memphis got clobbered by Mississippi State. And then Boston College and Virginia Tech, both of whom 
gave up leads. Uh, both have some real shaky, uh, shaky issues to deal with. The offensive line played for Boston College. Uh, Virginia Tech threw a bunch of interceptions. Grant Wells. They're, they're starting to look like not a lot of opportunities to win games and seasons can get sideways really quickly. Anybody in that group that you feel great about among those teams and games that I just mentioned? Well, I think they're in this group because uh, it's hard to feel it's hard to feel great about them, right? Um, I will say this. We'll start with Kansas because I don't think we've talked about them at all on, on the podcast. I, I don't think considering the – tortured and dark recent history post Mangino of Kansas football. Um, I don't think you can overstate what a good week one they had. They extended Lance Leipold. They're sort of planning some new football facility stuff. Um, Lance Leipold, you know, again, it, it's hard to drive a lot of optimism out of two and 10, but they did win at Texas and they took Tennessee tech and clobbered them. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if there's been a whole lot of just like laughers in the history of recent Kansas football. They won 56 to 10 uh essentially there's been laughing but often at them correct that is that is yeah. that is a fair point so um i i think just that win in general and the way they closed last season playing close games against teams like tcu and oklahoma i really feel like you know if it was a year ago at this time we would we would say what neil brown would name his score on saturday night and i think now you've got a reeling west virginia team and i think kansas is is capable and confident enough to show up and give them a game so now west virginia this is a, a real test for brown again i don't think he's in danger of being fired people have put him on the hot seat i believe off the top of my head the number is about 16 plus million to fire him and west virginia just does not have that kind of money it's very simple so um but i think neil brown needs to give the fan base a sign of progress here and boy were they close to it on thursday mm-hmm. in pittsburgh i mean boy did they play well? And you and you really saw some signs. And it's hard to throw the the late interception on JT Daniels. Went through the receiver's hands, you know. So I I and look, there's some it takes a while to get in sync. And JT Daniels should know this. This is his third team. It takes a little while to get in sync with your new skill guys. And so um I, I think that game's actually fairly interesting. Um to shift to Virginia Tech BC for a second. Um I want to say the last time Boston College, that Boston College beat Virginia Tech pretty handily on a Thursday or Friday night here uh, last year. Dracovic came back from the hand injury in that game. And I, I feel like both of these teams, if you don't win this game, whoo-wee, six is looking like a long road away. So yeah. uh, BC started five new offensive linemen. They did not run the ball well against Rutgers. And uh, look, they were self-inflicted wounds that cost them that game. Uh, there were there were turnovers. Uh, Phil Dracovic didn't play his best game. So now you're going to go. You're going to go on the road to Virginia Tech. They, you know, their backs are against the wall as well. Uh, they played poorly all around against Old Dominion. Um, did you, how much of that Old Dominion game did you watch? Brandon? I had, I had it on. Uh, okay. And I was, so I was watching it mostly flipping back and forth. What was on at the same time? Illinois, Indiana, maybe at the same yes. time? I think Friday night. Yes. So, I was, so had I was you ever seen this? I, I was at dinner with uh, a couple of our compadres and we, we, we claim this to be unique. Period. Just unique. There you go. There you go. Well done yes. with unique. Thank you, Wendy Billis. Um, there was a snapped field goal. Now, not a blocked field goal. We've all seen blocked field goals return the other way. There was a snapped field goal that was mishandled. Now, did you see this play? I did I not. Mean, it I was didn't. okay. So it was a missile of a snap, and it was off. And the holder went up and kind of did gymnastics to get it. Went through his hands. They sprint back to get it. So let's just say they're on the thirty-five. They greasy pig it at midfield to the to the opposite thirty-five. And a guy scoops and scores it. Now, in my mind, and other people at the table agreed with me at dinner, I had never seen a snap issue field goal scoop score the other way. Have you? No. The grease pig fumble reminds me of a play in a Louisiana Tech Mississippi State game a few years ago, but it wasn't that wasn't off a field goal. That was just a on the goal line and like they lost 96 yards or some such thing. Um, you know, and, oh, like I remember that. Yeah. yeah. It, it was like third and 92 or yeah, you know, yeah, something, something like just that. Some comical. Uh, yeah. But I don't thing. remember a scoop and score off of a, uh, off of a hot snap. Yeah. That's, it was, it was no, just weird to, 
to to watch it uh, to watch that and worth finding on your on your local uh, YouTube service provider because it was it was it was interesting. The other thing, and I can't remember if we mentioned this on Monday, I've never seen a team score forty points in a in a fourth quarter and lose. I, if that has ever happened in the history of college football, if somebody scored forty points in the fourth quarter and lost like App State did, I'd be stunned. I mean, uh, think about everything that has to go into play. Hey, there, there can't be many 40 point quarters, certainly not many 40 point fourth quarters, and definitely not any losing 40 point fourth quarters. The last time a research people came up with this, this one, the last time a team had a 40 point fourth quarter, it was when Houston scored 100. Remember when Houston scored, they yeah. scored 100 points, so they certainly didn't lose. Um, yes. <laughs> I don't know that it's ever happened that anybody scored 40 in the fourth quarter and lost. Yeah. And now yeah. that's Pollock a good month for to Iowa. Appalach- <laughs> Appalachian state's got, uh, uh, they can go try to score 40 in the game against, uh, against A&M this weekend. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I would never play Appalachian state out of conference. Like that, that would, if you're an athletic director, you are just inviting, you are waking up with a pit in your stomach and sweaty palms. <laughs> Cause that is just a good old fashioned program. Now, I, their defense obviously uh, certainly could not stop Phil Longo's offense. So I, I will say that, but like yeah. they, they usually have great lines on both sides of the ball. They have good athletes. They've had great receivers the past few years. Um, so, you know, that was, uh, that was offensive coordinator, Kevin Barbary's uh, debut. He had come from central Michigan and it's a pretty good debut. It, it is, you know, that to the scheduling philosophy mm-hmm. aspect of it, thousand percent agree with you because let's say you're one of the ultra elites or even even a power five team like north carolina if you win that game so what you're supposed to you're north carolina you're you're far better off going to play georgia or michigan or any or notre dame or anybody else where if you win, you get a little bang for your buck and it's not a catastrophe if you lose and there are a handful of teams like that, that I almost feel like are unschedulable, if that's even a word, which is probably not, but you shouldn't schedule them because if you're going to do something like that and play a gut busting game, go play a big time team, you know, somebody that you'll get something out of if you win, you know? Yeah. Remember the pandemic year, North Dakota state was supposed to play at Oregon. And if memory serves me right, it was going to be Trey Lance, Justin Herbert. Mm-hmm. Now, why? Because I want to say it was like they went Ohio State at home, North Dakota State at home in Eugene. Yeah, well, now, Herbert would have been gone, though, wouldn't he? Because pandemic year is 20. Herbert, you're right. Herbert finished in 19th. It was 20 draft. But still, yes, point remains. You're right. Point remains. Yes. Yeah. It, it, even worse if you don't have Justin Herbert in, in, right. in, in, yeah. your, schedule, in your schedule. It's in your yeah. schedule that game. Like, and in my mind, I was like, what are you doing? Um, yeah. Doing that. I mean, I would, I would not schedule any team that has Dakota in the name. <laughs> period, depending depending on direction or state or non-state, and I would I would find the team that went one and eleven in the FCS, and you know pay the halftime act a little more money. If they have a great band, that's that's super. But just if the if the point of the game is solely to win and win handily, why enter risk into that conversation? Yeah, you know that you know a couple of games that I really want to see that you know given the fact that I'm I'm going to be doing the um, the USC Stanford game on Saturday night that I'll have to watch back later, Oregon state and Fresno state, Mississippi state and Arizona. I boy, I could not have been more impressed with what I saw from Oregon state watching them Saturday night against Boise state yet going to Fresno state. um, It's going to be like a hundred degrees down there. They've never won there. Even that great team, that uh, Jonathan Smith, now the head coach, was mm-hmm. a quarterback of, went down there way back in the day. I think they've been on the cover of Sports Illustrated or some such thing, and it just got housed. And you're going up against um, a really high-level quarterback and Jake Hayner. Um, I, I, I really, really like Oregon State, and I don't think I like their chances a whole lot against Fresno State. I, I mean, it's a small spread, I'm sure, Probably a pick them game won't stun me if they win, but that's a that's a tough one to follow up on after you had a really good performance on Saturday night against Boise State. Yeah, and, and don't forget Jeff Tedford. Now he's seen a few ball games. That guy's probably played Oregon State fifteen times as a yeah, coach, probably. right? Like yeah. I, I mean, Jeff Tedford is a darn good. I mean, he was 
uh, Aaron Rodgers is college coach. Like he, he's, he's, it, it will be interesting. They, I think they opened with, uh, with, with an FCS team, Cal Poly. And so I, I'll be curious to see what he's been able to do with Jay Kaner. You want to talk about finishing school. Yeah. Jeff Tedford's pretty good guy to, you know, to, to, to finish you off. And I want to say Hayner was going to transfer to Washington and then the transfer rules were gummed up and he wasn't allowed. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of, you know, when I first started getting into this, Pat Hill was a coach at Fresno, anytime, anywhere, any place. And they certainly beat some people. They certainly scared the pants off some people. And so a vibrant Fresno is just good for all of our souls, I think, in, in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, what did I tell What did I say yesterday uh, on Monday, Reese, about, uh, about home, uh, I'm sorry. Home. Yeah. Home, about, home dogs, right? Home dogs, yeah. home dogs against, Take against good teams like that. Yes. Uh, th- that said, I made this point briefly the other day and it's, and I think it's worth dialing in on a little bit on Oregon state. They are a study in continuity. Um, you've got new coaches at Washington, new coaches at Oregon, new coach at Washington state. Um, you've got roster turnover left and right. You got Washington state's quarterback going to, you know, going to Arizona, um, you know, Oregon lost a ton of guys to the league as, as they're known to, as they're known to do. And you, you sit back and you say, okay, like Oregon state's just gotten like a little bit better. They've got um, some continuity at the quarterback position with chance Nolan. They've got uh, Musgrove, one of the better tight ends in the country. It's a great year for tight ends. If you like tight ends, this is one of the best years I can, I can ever remember. Uh, and you've got some now continuity with the, with the defensive staff changes that they've made. Uh, I think they made middle of the season last year. So I think there's something to be said. We can't just, it, just because the world is chaos now and 45% of the starters are transfers, you can't ignore the power of growing up together and continuity mm-hmm. together. Like, I do think that is still a dynamic force in this. You know, think about mid-major basketball, right? Like that's right. the, that that has always been the edge that the Butlers b- before they went to the Big East had over the, the, over the bigger conference schools. It's that sort of unity and continuity uh, I'm a big believer in Jonathan Smith as a head coach, and he's instilled that in uh, Corvallis. Yeah, I, I agree. I am too. And and congratulations to Arizona for oh, getting yeah. the win. And now, absent the occasional inexplicable egg that Mike Leach's teams have been known to lay throughout the years, I think this one should be pretty straightforward. I wouldn't think that Arizona, even with Jaden Delora, who really played well against San Diego State, uh, Jacob Cowling, who you mentioned, transfer receiver, was was just sensational. They they looked like a ball club, even with the weird punt in their own end zone. Um, I think Mississippi State will handle handle that fairly easily on the road. But the main thing I want to discuss here, and I probably should have had Taylor pull the clip from the Leach News Conference this week. Did you see that one of his backup quarterbacks proposed to his fiance after the win against Memphis the other night? I did yeah. not see that clip. I okay, did not right. see that clip. So, so they asked Leach if he had better than any... proposing after losing to Jacksonville State, like that Florida State lineman did. Last exactly, year. that was not good. So the marriage is already off to a better start. <laughs> but I, the reason I brought up Taylor, our producer, is because I thought maybe I should have had Taylor pull this clip instead. I'll just go into my bad Mike Leach imitation that amuses amuses mostly me um they asked him i said what advice do you have and, and uh, the guy's name is uh, chase loverich i believe and they said he proposed after the game what advice do you have and mike goes <clears throat> it sounds like i'm too late but you know first of all <laughs> first of all i'd say elope <clears throat> well and then if you're not going to elope well let's certainly get it done by the off week because there's no reason to torture yourself and then you you know you can honeymoon it up a little bit during the off week <laughs> honeymoon it that's up a pretty a little good bit leech by the way that's a pretty good bike leech the cough really sells it Reese. That, that's the uh, thing it's not really great anywhere but if you just randomly if you feel like you're losing it <laughs> just cough and you know clear your throat from the dip or whatever it is you know so <laughs> that's well at washington state i felt like it became like a, a a trope someone would like lob a superhero question to him every week in the press conference and he would just like eat it no one could speak two minutes and 27 seconds like aimlessly like mike leach and be like hilarious from word one to the last word like that's really like one of his eternal he's given us a lot in college football but we, that's one of his eternal gifts we did a for a few years on game day 
when we would come across those little gems like that, we did basically a spoof of those old Saturday Night Live deep thoughts with Jack yes. Handy. And we yes. called it Shallow Musings with Mike Leach. <laughs> and, you know, we just play the rip of marriage advice or, I mean, he didn't do this one, but why you shouldn't drink beer through a hot dog or, you know, to go with the thing that has been mascot around social media wars? recently. Wasn't it yeah. mascot wars? That like mascot wars is the, the toughest yeah, mascot who would win the yeah. fight and all of that. But this is a, this is a good question because my answer to this was always, as I go off on a leech tangent here, if you had a cage match, which coach would you take to win? And for until, until the departure of our friend Ed Ogeron, I steadfastly took Ed Ogeron. I didn't care back in the day when Charlie Strong was the head coach that he was in great shape. I didn't care about, uh, you know, Kyle Whittingham being in great shape. The only guy I would give pause to would be Cristobal because I think he has some, uh, some type of MMA training or some such thing. But I steadfastly went with Ogeron. Now I think I would default to Cristobal in a, in a steel cage match among college coaches. No, it's a, it's, it's a fair question. We, we, we devoted some time to this on my, uh, my former podcast on Yahoo. And, uh, you know, when you meet Mario Cristobal, um, that, that he certainly strikes quite a, uh, quite a presence. Uh, I mean, he is, he is every bit of the former lineman. I think this question is hard because so few head coaches are former linemen. You have a lot of former quarterbacks, you, you don't get a lot of linemen as coaches. I, I can count on one hand the, the Steve Adazios who've kind of come through that position, but they're really just, it, there was really a, dist and I do these carousel things every year and sort of try to game who's going to get hired and whatever. And O-line and D-line are not positions. And Ed and Mario are obviously former O-line and D-line are not positions where there are a ton of, of head coaches that come out of. I don't know who would be out of the ring first though. Um, that, that would be a good question to us. Who might wind up out of the ring first? I wouldn't want to fight Pat Fitzgerald. He's no, still, he's no. still got some, you know, a little bit of a uh, little bit of juice left in him. Yeah. He'd be a good one too. Do you have any, do you have, I've got a hot take for you. Oh, you go. referenced it earlier. Sort of a double barreled hot take. I don't think the PAC 12 is done as a playoff contender specifically. I don't think Utah's done. Mm -hmm. And I also don't think Notre Dame's done as a playoff contender because those are the two teams that even in defeat the other night, um, I think going, I, my perception of what Utah needed changed. I felt like they had to win that game because I felt like Florida was going to be a middling SEC team. And that may still prove to be true. I sort of suspect it will be at least by record. But the way the game unfolded, the way it was played first week, all of that kind of stuff, the way Utah looked playing it made me go, now, you know what? If they run it from here on out and look good doing it, I, I, could, I, I could get behind them in the fourth spot. And the same would be true for Notre Dame. Now, I'm not saying those two teams don't are, are, are without challenges in terms of uh, needing some explosive capabilities or whatever it might be on offense. I don't think either of those, the Pac-12, specifically Utah or Notre Dame are done as playoff contenders. In fact, I don't know what the playoff predictor says probably gives them like minus 5% of a chance. I'm not out on, on it yet. I'm not out so, on it yet. I've always chuckled at the eternal hypothetical. Well, what if they lose a field goal at the buzzer? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, when you start talking about like the Georgia plays Alabama and what happens if this, and you know, Utah literally did the hypothetical, right? Mm. Like you could not, press a team more and be closer to winning and not win than they were in, in that game. Now, again, it's a loss. I'm not saying that, but if right. you are judging and the humans are judging performance as much as they are judging, it's more than computers judging result. So mm -hmm. if humans are judging performance, that's as good as you can perform and lose mm -hmm. in, in what they did. You are not going to be outclassed by a physical, you know, sec, you know, upper middle class sec team. So I, I feel like if you're, if you're Utah, Obviously, you wanted to win. Obviously, there's going to be some griping over the uh, the, the third down uh, goal line call, which, again, could loom into some people's subconsciousness in, in all this. But, no, I feel good about that. Uh, yeah, Notre Dame certainly could come back because they've, quite frankly, done it before, you know, mm -hmm. like taking, taking a defeat and, and sort of run run the other way with it. Now, I'm trying to think. Were they undefeated all the years they made the playoff? I thought they had. Oh, no, they had one loss. The years and them and A&M at the buzzer, right? 
Yeah. Remember the year it was them or A and M. So yeah. Um they each had one loss. So I what they they had lost they had lost to Clemson in the ACC yes. championship game in the pandemic. Yes. Year, right? Yeah. Yes. And AM had lost early in the season. Mm-hmm. Um I don't remember to who. They, they all they blend together. Clobbered. They got clobbered by Alabama. They That's got, right. They and it was the, yeah. the caliber of that loss or the yeah. tenor of that loss, I guess. Yeah would be uh would be better so no i'm just not in the business of chucking chucking top 10 teams off the boat um you know w- with with one loss because there's always room for the 2007 principle and if you live yeah. through 2007 you just never know so yeah. we're, we're going to uh you know we're, we're going to keep them keep them rolling and until somebody declares themselves for that fourth spot i'm not going to start eliminating like good contenders from the fourth spot yeah that see that's it with me a lot of it probably has to do with a bit of a. Uh... Uh, you know, this was our producer Taylor's idea. Give me a lukewarm take. And by that, I mean, not necessarily take that, you know, biblically, I will spew thee out of my mouth. If, you know, if it's lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold. This is one that I'm not sold on, but I don't Clemson's offensive line worried me almost as much as quarterback play. I was, I was close to texting you watching that game Monday night and saying, is Clemson ACC Iowa, you know, um, <laughs> and, you know, great defense, no offense. Obviously the offense picked it up and, and played better later in the game. Um, and, you know, DJ got it going. I think they, ha- I think they have some threats and going into the season, I really didn't believe that they, that they did. I thought if there would be one, it might be North Carolina state, but now maybe even though Wake Forest has struggled, um, you know, against them. I think that, uh, I think it, it could be Wake, could be NC State and, you know, and maybe, and maybe even Pittsburgh as, you know, as they continue on there. Yeah. We haven't spent much time and, and we're probably wrapping it up here talking about NC yeah. State because I feel like that's a really interesting game. Like they, they win at East Carolina in a game where statistically they dominated and they completely self-inflicted massive wounds on the goal line consecutively in the fourth quarter. Um, I don't know the final numbers, but they must have outgained them because they marched up and down the field against them. But yet they need a lucky, and that's all that is, is lucky field goal. I'm sorry, field goal miss and extra point miss Mm -hmm. in the final five minutes to come out of that game with a win. Um, Do we gauge them by like, you know, what happened between the end zone in the, in the 99 yards before the goal line where they sputtered, or do we, do we, do we discredit them for not putting away, you know, I, what I think is a very good salty ECU team in a difficult mm-hmm. place to play. Yeah. I'm looking at the, at the box score now, Pete, and I wouldn't have guessed this to be honest, but uh, from watching the game, but East Carolina outgained them. Huh. Um, they, they both passed uh, for more yards. They did rush for 17 fewer yards than, uh, than NC state. They outgained them by about 40 yards. The big difference is they were really good on third down and NC State was not. But I'm going to, I'm actually going to take some positives from that game because I sort of, I didn't mean, well, yeah, maybe I did mean to offend a little bit. Last year, uh, NC State lost a game that, you know, probably should have won Miami game. And I, I opined on the air that perhaps uh, the new Clemsoning was wolf packing. You know, finding a way, you know, the Clemsoning is dead and gone sure. and that maybe finding a way to lose a game. I take great heart that NC State didn't do that Saturday. Now, you're right. I mean, missed some kicks or whatever, but they also had a couple of opportunities to kind of put that game away no early question. and they still won. So I'm actually I'm actually taking heart and taking a little more confidence in North Carolina State. Because they got out of there with a win. If you've been, and you have, I know, but people from different regions may not understand the disdain. um, And now I'm going to make ECU people mad, but I guess the inferiority complex that they feel toward the other quote unquote, bigger schools in the state, particularly that one and Carolina and, and Duke to a degree in some sports. And they want to, they want to win those games more than they want to breathe and their fans want it, you know, so badly that it creates this cauldron of intensity and for state to get out of there with a win. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm taking that as a mark in the toughness column, a good win and establishing themselves as a, as a legitimate threat to Clemson in the ACC. Yeah. The, uh, 
the NC State, per, NC State perpetuating its own stereotype narratives that would have flown out if they had, right. if they had continued and thrown that game away would have been loud and uh, would have been pronounced. Uh, I was texting with Devin Leary's father, Glenn. I went to the Leary house this year for, for a feature story. And the younger Leary son, Donovan, is on Illinois. And I said to Glenn, if you had lost both those games back-to-back nights, the way that Illinois lost to Indiana, oh. and then the way NC State, I was, I was like, I was like, I would have like, I wouldn't even known what to do. I was like, that would have been a special brand of family heartbreak if you have sons on the losing end of both those two games. Cause it was it was unbelievable. And he I got I got a couple of good LOLs out of out of that one. But um, and I had thought I'd text him because I thought Glenn and his wife Lori had been in Bloomington and then went to Greenville. But I think they went to week zero against uh brown mustard and champagne. And yeah. And they were uh they were at Greenville there. But that's that would have been cruel, uh cruel and unusual. There there were two cruel losses in the Big Ten last week, and it'll be interesting to see how teams respond from there. Illinois had no business losing that game, and and Purdue, you know, have, they haven't read Homer Smith's book on clock management and didn't, and they squandered that game against Penn State somehow. And those those are the kind of things that stick with you. They can they can change the direction of seasons. You wanted to um, you wanted to know a little bit about how we were going to handle this week game day and then going to the farm. Yes. I want to interview you, Reese. Okay, Uh, go ahead. We'll we'll, we'll close with this. Okay, We'll close with this. So this is a, this is a typical second Saturday in September tradition for you. The Mm -hmm. game day on site game that night, typically in a different place. Walk me through your logistics from alarm clock to head hitting pillow on Saturday <laughs> of how your day of college football will go. I think it's something every fan would, would love to see and hear about. And uh, I'm jealous of it. I, I've divided going back before that I've divided the week a little bit in preparation, sort of spent some time game uh, early, move more to the show mixed in with game. And then by, by Friday, by Thursday night, really, it'll be all game day prep. So when I get up on Saturday morning, probably wake up, um, five to five thirty central time since we are in Austin. Um, go there, do the show. It'll it'll all be about the game. Uh, I mean about the uh, show. Pardon me about game day, and with the game preparation kind of done, except for last minute stuff. So you know, I'll go in. I like to get in where there are very few people in the office because I like that little time with just. Uh, a couple of the producers around, you know, just to kind of get settled before the chaos really starts. So I'll get in, we'll lock in on the show. We'll do that. We'll crush it. It'll be fun. You'll be breaking news throughout it. And then as soon as, as soon as it's over, Kirk and I will, uh, you know, head out, fly out to the farm, get there, hopefully in plenty of time to get there, you know, maybe three, two, three hours before kickoff. So I'm, I'm going to and- stop you because you're you're being modest, and a very key part of this is the flying. <laughs> if I'm curious about yours, and I and I think it's okay because we work for a billion dollar company, and these are very important, uh, you know, tent poles of our billion dollar mm-hmm. company that you're going to fly. I'm assuming you're going to fly private. I don't think you're going to go to the Austin Airport right. and pray for the jet blue to to make it on time. Correct. So, yeah. I, I, one of my one of my things I'm curious about is so say you get to the airport at noon Central Time. And there's going to be a million games on. Are you going to like lock in on your depth chart and what you have to focus on that night calling a game? Um, Or or are you going to have three games on and do that? I think that's like because that's the part of the day where it's like, all right, we just did this crazy show in front of thousands of you know live fans. Now I have to go in a hermetically sealed booth and you know deliver a broadcast to millions of people uh, wh- wh- how do you handle the middle part i will I'm have you, i'm not gonna bo- let you gloss over your yeah. bouginess Reese. yeah I'll, <laughs> I'll have i'll have my boards out on okay. the plane and i'll be going over stuff putting in final notes uh but i'll have games up i mean i i, I wouldn't be able to function if i didn't you know so we'll as as much as the wi-fi will allow we'll be you know keeping up and, and watching games on the way and I'll have my boards out putting notes and going over and practicing um, pronunciations. And there are some, you know, there are some challenging ones on oh, yeah. both sides. And there are some, there are some even that I've found in doing that you even need to practice, even if you know the guy, just because 
you know, it's a little complex. So yeah. running through it and yeah. saying it aloud a few times doesn't, you know, doesn't kill you. So um, I'll be you doing Herbie, things- like say mm-hmm. long Polynesian names back and forth to each other on the plane. To like- <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we haven't. I, Kirk, Kirk cracks me up because he, first of all, he's, he's awesome to do a game with because he just, you know, he knows everything. He's ready to go. He's so uh, terrific on his feet and everything. But the one thing that always cracks me up is if there is one, he's like, yeah, you say that one. And then of course, when he says it, he, he executes it, but you know, just, yeah. he executes it flawlessly. He just says but it's the, a big DJ, right? He doesn't yeah, say the, the, build, <laughs> the build up to it is always, yeah, you say that one, you say that one, you say that one. And then when he has to say it, he, he crushes it. So, so yeah, we might, we might do some of, uh, do some of that and bounce them back and forth, make sure we've got the same thing on our boards in terms of um, guys, you know, uh, depth chart wise, is there anybody we need to add? That'll be some of the things you'll do at, in the booth right before the game starts with the SID. You know, have a look at this. Is there anybody that they're going to stick in there um, today that, you know, maybe didn't play last week or is going to, you know, be a part of it? That kind of thing. Double check a couple of pronunciations if you want to, if there are, you know, any other notes that you want to get in. And then and then just try to try to go call the game and, and have a blast and then, race back to the airport i'm taking a red eye back home and oh, wow. uh, and oh. then and then so i'll be, be up for 24 straight hours basically. yeah i'll be i'll be good and i'll be good and tired by the time uh, by the time the plane lands on sunday morning but it'll it'll be a great day it's always fun Wow. That's, uh, that's what, what time do you land in the Bay area to get over to the good thing is there has to be plenty of private airports because it's like people fly private to go to Costco in the Bay area. So yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not positive. I, okay. I was told, I think it's going to be about a three and change flight. Okay. So if we, yeah. So if we take off at, you know, 1230 central time, you know, you get there and by Four central, which would be two on the West Coast. You'll be in great. You'll be there a couple okay. hours before the game. Hopefully, even better than that. So, and you go like straight that. to the game from there. Yeah, airport. yeah. Okay, that, that's the plan. That's that's the plan. I think. Will you wear the same suit? That it's all supposed depends. to be very hot. It's going to be hot. I'm going yeah. to have I'm going to have backup backup situation ready, but it might just be a change of a shirt and undershirt, that kind of thing. Okay. All right. This, this, the people need to know if you're going to have me interview on our, on our podcast, I, no, that's, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to dial right down and, yeah. uh, and, and find out exactly, uh, right down to the wardrobe. Uh, I, I like, you know, that's the thing I like to, I like to feel fresh when you go in, you don't want to feel all disheveled. So I, yeah. I probably will at least, at least change shirts. I'll probably also be a little hungry because I don't know what it is. I don't like to be full before a show or before a game. So hmm. that'll, that'll limit the, caloric intake before the show and might before the game i'll probably i'll eat some lunch on a plane or something let me ask and then i'll gorge late at night which is really bad for a man it's really healthy yeah yeah um how much caffeination do you do you do before a game like that there has to be you have to have some thought to this right like because you don't want to be hyped up and then crash but you also especially if you're having a long day like that you can't like sort of be low so how do you how do you manage your caffeine intake before you broadcast I don't, um, because I grew up in Northwest Alabama, where you get sweet tea intravenously, you know, like <laughs> at birth. so I'm, I'm largely immune to caffeine and I, I drink way too much diet soda and okay. I drink a bunch of coffee. So, and I'll drink, you know, nitro cold brew. So I feel like I'm kind of immune to it every okay. now and then. I can hit the nitro cold brew and I'll go, you know, I'll be a little bit like Kramer. I have another cafe latte. You know, maybe I'll feel that a little. So I have to be careful with that. But other than that, I, I don't even notice it sometimes. All right. No, that's uh, that, that's pretty interesting. Do you do you medicate, if you will, throughout the broadcast then? Like during a commercial break, you're you're what? you're crushing a cold brew or a DC? Yeah. Water most of the time. Water. Okay. Yeah, water right. during water during the broadcast and, and before because the hydration helps you helps your voice stay right, you know, as much as you yeah. can. I, I had a vocal coach years ago tell me um, for every caffeinated soda or coffee you drink, I want you to drink the same amount of water. I said, do you realize I will never leave the bathroom if I do that? You know, what I mean? it's like, <laughs> we got to be a balance there. Yeah. So that's essentially seven hours of narrating live television on Saturday. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. it'll be fun, man. I, I mean, you know what? 
I try not to be a knucklehead about this job. We've got great jobs. I mean, the fact oh, that yeah. you and I get to do this and people oh. are kind enough to download it and listen, amazing. And the fact yeah. that we get to do it on television Saturday, couldn't be anything better for, for a college football uh, nerd slash junkie like me and you for that matter too. Yeah, no, it's, uh, and I, I'm not asking this like out of pity. I mean, that's a, that's a sports fan's dream day, right? You get for to, sure. you get to yeah. be part of college game day and, you know, I had never been part of one until Saturday. So like I, and I've obviously walked by them and been at them, but not in, mm. in sort of inside the belly of the beast. It's a, that's an energy jolt now, Whew. you know, like there's, <laughs> it is, there's it? sitting yeah. in my uh, spare room at my house, looking at my, uh, looking at my TVU camera and, and talking about, you know, whatever injury news, that's one thing. And I'm not good at it, but it's not like, I'm not sweating through my <laughs> sweating through my shirt, go out there and there's 10,000 fans screaming. Um, and then the lights go on and you see your face on a, you know, massively and, on a screen that my face should not be on. I, oh, I don't even think I should be on a small one, never mind a billboard. So and and remember, a, everything, remember everything, remember everything, everything is on the record. I should have known better. Not that I really regret anything I said or anything like that, but um, I did notice that my pregame comments to the Ohio State crowd or pre-show comments got picked up as news in some quarters too. <laughs> so just remember that, Pete. Everything you say is going to get out there. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep it. Up. I'm going to keep buttoned up, man. I'm gonna keep buttoned up. So no, it'll, right, be, man, we'll it'll make be fun some... on Saturday, man. It'll be fun That's, on Saturday. Yeah, looking forward to it, and looking forward to making some picks on Friday too. Awesome. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.